Thank you very much, Juan. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Como va? Bien? Does it? <laughs> I've been trying to learn a bit of Spanish. I'm afraid that's it. Um, so from now on, we'll be talking in English. Um, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here on stage with Richard. I've had an amazing time researching uh, the man's life and what he's achieved in the music business. Uh, and it's going to be a real treat to talk to him for the next hour and to hear what he has to say to us about his experiences and what he's done. So uh, we were having a chat last night. And um, well, just to let you know a little bit about uh, this man's background to give you the scope of what he's achieved. He had his first hit as a songwriter in 1966. Uh, he was in a successful band for a while after that. Um, he founded an iconic label called Sire Records, which uh, put out little-known acts like the Ramones and Blondie and Madonna later, for example, just to name a few. And uh, he's also had a very big part in influencing the digital world in the music business. And when we were talking last night, uh, we decided that that would be the best place to start. This is Columbia 3.0 and Resonancia 13. So uh, Richard founded an aggregator called The Orchard, back in 1997. So Richard, if you don't mind, let's start with that. You know, tell us the story of The Orchard and how it came about. Um, can you hear me out there? Okay, <laughs> it's, it's hard to hear up here. So if, it, if you don't hear what I'm saying, let me know. Um, okay, so in 1997, I founded, co-founded a company with a man named Scott Cohen. Uh, the company is called The Orchard. The Orchard is a 21st century digital distributor of music and media, but primarily music. And it has offices all over the world. And what's interesting about it is that in 1997, when we started the company, it was internet-based, uh, and the phone. Died. It was internet-based, and um, we started signing digital rights then. And uh, it's grown from nothing to today, where we have around nine million titles. So it's quite a large company, but what it does is that it, it enables music from anywhere in the world to be available anywhere else in the world. Uh, independent artists, independent labels, and um, it's now become a big business, but not just for us as a business, but for the world at large. Just check the mic. Okay, the mic's back on. So, but leading up to founding The Orchard, Richard, tell us how it came about. So when we were talking uh, the other day, you said you started by working with a company called CD Now. And you kind of foresaw the coming of the internet and the influence it would have on the music business. And you were ahead of time with that. So I could ask, I don't know if you're hearing, I'm you know, speaking English, but um, um, are you familiar with anybody with the early days of the internet? Um, the companies that sold uh, music online. There was a company called CD Now, where you could go on the internet and you could order um, music, CDs sent to you. And that was the beginning of it. And from that, we deduced that there would be more coming after broadband and wireless that you'd you'd begin to see the possibility of downloading music, uh, getting music on your mobile phone, um, getting files that are sent to you, rather than the physical CD. And so uh, you, went, you went on to found The Orchard, um, and so you started acquiring a lot of catalog. And when iTunes finally launched, you found yourself in a very powerful position, didn't you, as a company? Well, when iTunes finally launched, we had about 150,000 titles, which sounds like a lot, but we quickly became the largest independent supplier to iTunes and then kept growing and growing and growing to the point now 
on iTunes, we account for about 25 percent, 25 percent, which is 20 uh, something cinco uh, percent, uh, 25 percent of uh, of all the music one would find on iTunes. Um, I think the thing that that I'd like to, um, if I could keep going, talk about is that. I've had an interesting career in music, and I'm uh, assuming that whoever is out there is um, interested in music, how it develops, and um, perhaps um, selling music or just participating in some way. And I, I think what I'd like to um, what I'd like to have you understand is I began very young in the music business. I've been in the music business now, it must be over 50 years. And um, I started as a songwriter. Um, I, I wrote songs for different artists and had uh, a number one record when I was 22 years old. Uh, it was a song that I wrote, which probably nobody knows here, but still, it was called My Boyfriend's Back. So it went my boyfriend's back. And, and just so uh, to see if it makes a difference to you, I'll sing some of it. My boyfriend's back and you're going to be in trouble. And then everybody goes, hey la, hey la, my boyfriend's back. But anyway, it sold millions of records. Yeah, well. Uh, Thank you, Richard. Oh, yeah. But I'll sing some more, so don't worry. I, Do you want to hear mean, some um, more? Yeah. So, okay. So um, it sold millions of records. But what was important was that at that point, not only was I able to be a successful songwriter, but I became a successful producer as well. And in the, back in those days, you had to go to an expensive professional studio. You had to hire musicians and pay them to play your songs. It's, it's not like it is today, it's wonderful today. You can be with your computer at home and create music. None of that was possible. So I grew from that um, and uh, met uh, a man, Seymour Stein, who was about my age, and we formed Sire Records. Now, Sire Records was an interesting company because it started uh, just with an idea that we could Go and and it, it's applicable to the orchard because it started with the idea that you could go out to the rest of the world, in this case uh, for Sire, was Europe, and license music and bring it back into the United States. And um, we were able to successfully secure albums through, through various means of uh, seduction. Um, one of them that you may or may not find interesting was we would go to England and go to the export divisions of the various record companies and what we would bring with us would be New York cheesecakes. Cakes, you know, um, uh, and, and we would use that as an inducement to get people to give us music. And strangely enough, they did. Food is a very, um, um, I, what's the word? It, it, um, it's a seductive feature. It, it, it's easier than making a promise. You give somebody something that tastes good, and they give you something back. Well, we were able to license albums and bring them back, and that was the beginning of Sire. Now, what's interesting about that, we're now talking about late 1960s, approaching 1970. At that time, in America, the conversion from AM to FM were, was happening. And FM is a stereo signal. Man has achieved already that he's told us, right? Okay, cool. Sounds good. So uh, before we go on, we are going to try and give you a chance to ask some questions later. I think if we can pull it back to the orchard and the current landscape, Richard. So you founded this highly successful company. 
and it started as a, as a kind of straightforward aggregator, so distributor of tracks, but now it's evolved with more services. It's more of a service company. You offer kind of interactive marketing um, to your clients as part of the service and other services. How and why did that evolution take place? You know, talk us through that. Well, um, the business, the music part of the business of aggregating music from across the world was the easier part because all you had to go do is go to there and tell people your, um, your story and you could get them to give you the content because you would then make it available for sale. But as the world, the digital world got more complex, um, you need to provide more and more services. So the services we came up with uh, traditional distributors just make the music available. But a 21st century distributor needs to do a lot more. Um, we, we have an, a division that um, works with sync and advertising clients to take the independent music and make it available in films and TV. We have a division that does a collection from performance rights societies, societies that um, around the world that collect but don't pay out unless they know who they're going to pay to. We give our artists a chance to participate in that and then we collect on their behalf and pay, and pay them. We also have an, what we call an integrated marketing department there's probably 15 people that do nothing but work with the clients, labels, and artists to um, get a presence on the internet for these, um, for these artists when they have a release. We make all the releases global. So if you're a Colombian artist affiliated with The Orchard, when that video and song is released to iTunes, it's also released to every streaming service, every mobile operator, every place that digital music is sold around the world. So you can see the enormity of the whole thing. Um, and um, we also have uh, people like me that listen and work uh, with some artists to find the best music and perhaps enable the music to get remixed, um, to, get, um, to, to, to get a, a, a better positioning for it. And lastly, we work very closely with YouTube. We have uh, our own YouTube channels, um, which are comprised of the labels that we have. And by virtue of that, we have so many views that we can get the advertising rates up so there's a chance of labels affiliated with us earning money from um, visuals on YouTube. And that's, uh, as I understand it, a very important part of your business. The team is one of the largest teams, right? The, the YouTube it's, team. Um, it's becoming a larger and larger part. Obviously, um, iTunes was the biggest part and still is, but uh, YouTube is becoming so significant that we're adding, we now have about 20 people, we're adding another 20 people and developing a whole creative space um, just uh, for creating um, uh, video content uh, for YouTube. So what you allow the artists to use the creative space or, yeah. or bring producers if, in? Right now it'll just be in New York, but um, uh, I can envision creative spaces uh, around the world um, where artists can create videos, um, create um, a game, create whatever it is they want, and it will go through our channel setup and be available and be uh, available to be monetized so you can make money from it. So the strategy behind this is basically maximize the amount of kind of different income streams, do everything you can to create new income streams and make the best of them. Well, that's what you have to do. Oh, good, they turned that light out. Yeah, I hope they keep it out. I could see you now. You know, it's kind of wacky. Um, but 
yeah, the idea is to provide a large cross-section of services. Previously, you would sign with a record company in the old world. You would sign with a record company and hope they would do a good job um, for your music. And some of them did a very good job. But in the new world, um, we're talking about a distributor or a record company has to do a, a lot more. And, um, and, and we do do that. Okay, thanks, Richard. And so you led the way um, as a distributor and a service company, but now the landscape is getting quite competitive. There are you know, new companies like Believe Digital launching uh, around the world and establishing um, you know, big footprints. And then there's Cobalt, which has had some big hits, Cobalt Artists and Label Services, with the Pet Shop Boys, for example. So how, going forward, do you plan to differentiate yourselves and, and stay ahead? Well, I don't think we really have to do very much. I mean, we just have to continue on the path we're on. Um, competition is good. Uh, it's better to have more than less. Um, you know, you learn from each other, and um, um, I think we're the best, so we'll continue to do well. Okay. Nice answer. And so you, you said that you, you kind of A&R some of your acts specifically. So can you give us an idea of who those acts are, kind of some of the top line acts that you run? Ah, well, some of you remember they're all independent acts, so it's not about top line. In terms of the orchard, it's about a lot. Um, there, there's a, I, again, I don't know who you'd know in Colombia. So, uh, so um, I work with a group we just, somebody would just have on, going out on tour now, it's a woman named Queen Kwong, and um, she's going to be an uh, interesting, uh, successful artist. It's going to take a little time. Is that so, Queen, Queen Kwong, did he say? Kwong, yes. Do we, do we know her in the audience? Have we heard no, of her no, yet? of course not. Okay. But you, you, could go to, you could go to YouTube and look for her videos, Queen Kwong. I produce records by a, um, a, a, a girl group called, um, called the Dum Dum Girls. Um, I don't know if they've come to Colombia either, so... Dum Dum Girls, anyone? Yeah, we you got some... You actually yeah, know the go. Dum Dum Girls, <laughs> yeah. Um, there's somebody, if she's out there, I actually took a picture of you with dark hair, because you look like Dee Dee, you could be Dee Dee's sister. So, um, so if, if, if you're out there, and there are so many um, uh, girls with dark hair out there, so who knows. But um, you could be Dee Dee's sister from the Dum Dum Girls, and... You never know. Um, you never know what that leads to. Um, I, it's, um, it's sort of hard to tell this story not knowing if you're understanding it, but, um, but I enjoy it anyway. Let, let me say that um, I, I basically came to Columbia because I was invited, um, but to really get a feeling for myself of... Um, what was going on with music here. And it's not enough to just say salsa, cumbia. You know, it's, it's more what are, what are young people doing today that would make them want to be part of the rest of the world of music? I mean, do, do you want to succeed here? Do you want to learn more about the rest of the world? You know, for me, that was important. And how, how do things work here? What kind of what kind of country is this? I mean, all of that. When I started The Orchard, part of it was about music and digital and all that. But the other part was of greater interest to me. It was, can music, if it comes from one place, if it comes from one place in the world, can it influence another place? Can, it, can music make you understand something about somebody else that you didn't know. If there's somebody you hated, could it make you like them? You know? And, and to me, that's the challenge of the digital world. You know, you make money, you don't make money. We're all gonna live and die rich or poor. That's not what it's about. If you really care about music or about media or the wonderful thing we just saw with the animation, if you really care about that, then you need to care about the other stuff that comes along with it. And um, that's what got me to Colombia. Not that I think Colombia is going to change it. I have no idea. But that's what got me here. It gets me to go to Argentina. It gets me to go to China. It gets me to go to India. And every place I go, 
there's some piece of great music that somebody elsewhere is going to love. I think that's a really important lesson for all of us. So after everything he's achieved, Richard still wants to put his feet on the ground, experience new things, and look for new things and opportunities. And that's, that's quite inspirational, and we should all take something away from that. Never, less, never rest on your laurels. Always be curious. Always look for opportunities, whether it's founding a digital infrastructure company or looking for the next hit in the next country. I think that's a, a great listen. Um, so back to the major, the, well, the, the kind of recent industry landscape. It's gone through massive amount of change. What do you see the role of the majors being now? How, how do you see their development going? Well, the, the role of the major labels is still very much the same. I mean, they have, uh, they have the money, they have experience, um, and they have the ability um, to um, help something um, break and become big. But they will change, but they'll change from within because the new generation of people that come to work at the major labels are going to come from a generation that, was, um, that grew up in the digital or internet period. And um, they could follow, you can follow some of the old rules. I mean, someone like me has a bit of wisdom to impart. But it's just like the old prospector, it's experience. But the moment and what you do in the moment comes from this generation. It comes from the generation that, that, that was born into the, um, uh, into the new world, into the digital uh, world. So the majors will continue. They'll change uh, a bit. And, um, you know, there'll be, room for, um, there'll be room for everyone, especially with YouTube. Um, the individual artist or individual label will have the opportunity to achieve some sort of recognition uh, without um, a major label contract. Well, that's, that's interesting. Let's talk about YouTube a little bit more. So you've seen all of these changes in the industry. YouTube, um, so Gangnam Style was a massive viral hit last year. Do you see that? I mean, what, what are your comments about that? Is it, is it demeaning music in any way that it was all about a spectacle and a dance? Or do you see it as a great thing that's just happened? Well, it, Gangnam Style is... Um, I assume we all know that here, yeah, um, is uh, just pop music. It, it doesn't matter that, it, well, it doesn't matter that it's Korean, because who the hell ever knew anything about Korean music or about essentially Koreans before that in terms of um, um, a worldview, uh, music worldview. Um, but it's just pop music. There's no way it denigrates music or anything. It's a nice, enjoyable, jump around fun. And it's great that it was successful. There's room for everything. There's room for wonderful classical music. There's room for great jazz. There's room for the blues, um, uh, salsa, you know. And it all fits together. And when you catch that magic song that catches people's imagination like that did, um, it's a wonderful thing. And the fact that it came through um, a new medium like YouTube was, uh, was really great. Eventually, it got promoted by record companies, but, but uh, it was started and when... broke through by people finding it in word of mouth, and that's how it happens today. Yeah, it was almost promoted when, it was, when people stopped listening. Do you know what I mean? So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a great, great viral phenomenon. I suppose what you're, you're touching on there is that it helps democratize the music industry a little bit. So if something is great, it will shine through uh, in a viral way on these sorts of platforms. Well, we could say that. If something's great, it might shine through. But if it's not great, it never will shine through. So uh, great is the minimum criteria, you know. Minimum criteria. Okay, um, so w while we're on YouTube, we're touching on what is probably or arguably the biggest streaming music service out there uh, in certain terms. So let's move on to music streaming. You know, it's a new transition that the business is moving into. You've seen a lot. You've seen a lot of changes. What is your view on streaming? There's controversy at the moment. You know, artists are pulling their records, saying we don't get paid enough. Uh, in countries like Scandinavia, it's propelling the market forward. So how do you see it fitting into the landscape and into the future? Well, Scandinavia is the home of Spotify, which um, throughout Europe is a, a significant um, um, uh, driver of revenue. Um, 
strangely enough, the, the other place that Spotify, uh, we do very well through Spotify. Scandinavia is, and believe it or not, the next place is Spain. It does amazing in Spain. Um, but my feeling about streaming services, there's um, a gentleman here from Deezer. Deezer opened up in, um, there, there they are, hello. Matthew's over there, um, yeah. Uh, okay, I better say something nice. Um, <laughs> Deezer, Deezer um, is making an aggressive effort in, um, in, in the Southern Americas. You see, I know not to say South America, because we're, it's all America, including the United States. But, um, but Deezer is a really good service, and, um, and it pays to pay attention to them. Um, but Spotify is good, RDO works, there's going to be um, things in the United States that goes further beats. It's going to be, it, you, you have to find the one that works best for you. But when it comes to streaming, you, you have to know that that's the future of everything. Soon you're not going to buy a CD or a record. You'll still buy vinyl if you're a collector. You'll buy... CDs and vinyl products of artists that you really love because you want to support them. But truthfully, all the music you're ever going to want is going to be available to you through streaming services. And you'll be able to find it, get it, re-listen to it. Uh, and in the end, it pays for the artist because the streaming service acts as a discovery service to make you do something else. Go to the show, buy the, buy the CD or buy the vinyl at the moment. Um, and it's, it's a great way, it, it's just the way music is going to be ingested in the future. As the younger and younger generation, people who are six and eight, they're not going to know the other stuff anymore. When, when, you're, when you're a child of that age, as you grow to a teenager and you're in your 20s, this is how you're going to get the music. You'll get it through streaming services. And, and you see even iTunes is going into something called iRadio that's going to be announced soon. What's good about that is you'll be able to uh, get your radio stations together. You'll be able to hear the song you like and with a click of a button, you'll be able to purchase it through iTunes. But Deezer seems to be making a sincere effort in South America, and, and I think they're really worth paying attention to. So let's ask, how, how many Deezer users are there in the, in the house tonight? Okay, good. Uh, okay. Great, good stuff. Matthew, did you turn around there and see that? <laughs> and uh, uh, apart from then Deezer, what about other streaming services? Are there people using other streaming services? Okay, so yeah, we've got a few. Mostly Deezer, but a few others. Um, so then back to the payouts debate. I mean, Atoms for Peace made a big noise about it. You know, Thom York's band um, sort of famously pulled their record a month or so ago. Do you think they're just throwing their toys in too soon? They're not waiting until the services scale? You know, you see the books, you see the payouts. How, how does that actually look? I mean, I could understand an artist feeling that um, they have people out there that will purchase what they put out. And if they put it on the streaming services, uh, what's going to happen is people will hear the music and, uh, and not go out and buy the record. I don't think that's true. In fact, uh, using Deezer as an example in France, we actually, because it's a French country, uh, company to begin with, but actually in France, when we were featuring music on Deezer in France, we found that people were going to Fnac and buying the albums. It was being played through Deezer, and people were going to the main retailer in France at the time and buying, and buying the albums of the artists they heard. Now, that's another thing. For the most part, nobody's selling that many albums anymore unless you're an extremely recognizable artist with a huge fan base. We're back to, do I like that song? It's a track-based business. So you can make an album, but you better have a damn great, now not good, but great song that's going to hold and attract the attention of people if you want them to pay attention to the rest of what you have to say. 
Great. So, um, and, and so you see that streaming services at the moment kind of like the new radio then and leading to these new purchases well, or I ancillary mean, purchases. It's, I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's like the new radio. Um, and I guess it is. I mean, that's where you, um, that's where you hear and discover music. You'll, you'll discover it from streaming services. You'll discover it from YouTube and even sometimes on Facebook. Um, but I would, I would say that's how people discover music. In general, in, in the world in general, I feel that radio is an in, still an important ingredient, but not the only ingredient, and certainly no longer the primary. It's a major piece of the puzzle. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I think we're going to move to the floor in a minute, so we're going to let you ask some questions, guys. Uh, but I think let's, let's glean a few of the stories uh, from you, if, if you don't mind, Richard. No. Are, we know you have some great stories, so uh, would, you, would you care to share some of them with us? Uh, and if you would, I mean, well, I suppose we should... Well, well, my, one of my personal favorite ones is, is the story behind the strange loves. And, uh, so, um, so, okay, just to show you... Um, you know, I should stand up, but just, just to show you um, how, how it works in the business and seizing opportunity. So I told you a bit about my boyfriend's back, you know, and that song. So after a while, that was written as part of, uh, we were part of a writing team that worked in an area of New York that was around Broadway in New York City. And there was a building where all the songwriters worked called the Brill Building, B-R-I-L-L. -L. And in that building, if you were a young songwriter, you could walk around to record companies, play your songs, at that time on the piano, and, and they would try to get cover records on them. So we did very well for a while, and we produced a lot of female artists girl groups. Well, in the early 60s, 1964, the British started coming over, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Who, and they were writing their own songs. So there was no way that anybody was going to be covering our songs any longer. So we made a record, and it was a ska record, and in the middle of of the song, of, there was a narration, and one of my partners narrated with a British accent. And, uh, you know, it, it was a fake British accent, and um, there's no sense doing it because I don't even do it that good. But, but um, what happened was a disc jockey said, oh, I can make this number one if you come down to Virginia and perform. But we weren't performers, but we thought we would go anyway, and we went. We got to the radio station, and he said, well, b well, before that, we decided we couldn't be British. So we went and picked something else from the British Empire. We became Australians. So I don't know how many of you know Australia, but it has nothing to do with anything except we were no longer American when we formed the strange loves. We became Australian. We went down to this radio station, pulled up in front of it in a car, and he said, you can't come in here. You have to go out to the airport, drive in a small plane, and pull up at the terminal, which we did. And there were, must have been hundreds of kids with jelly beans and teddy bears throwing them out of, saying, um, Virginia Beach, Virginia, welcomes Australia's strange loves. Well, of course, we weren't Australian. We were barely strange loves. We were three guys from, from New York City. But what happened was the radio thought we were Australian and started playing it alongside the Beatles. And it turned out we had a top 10 record. And it's a song that, that I, this one you might know. It's called I Want Candy. I want candy, boom, 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 boom. A universal beat, you know. But, <laughs> but the thing, 
The thing that's interesting about it, and if you're serious about the music business, it shows you that the song is important because that song last year made 10 times as much money for the songwriters as it did when it was a hit record in 1965. In movies, in television commercials, constantly used. So, so the lesson there is that the real value is in the song and in the publishing. If you're an artist, your value is in touring because you're probably not going to sell millions of records again. There will be some people, some will, but the most, you have to always think of the song and you always have to think of the value of the future of what it might be. That's a, that's a really big lesson. So it comes back to the song, write a brilliant song, and then after you have it, be creative in how you promote it. Whether that's pretending you're from Australia or being amazing using digital media, you know, you have to stand out somehow as well. Well, well the, the, the best part is, um, in 1980, I was invited to Australia to produce an Australian group. They were called Mental as Anything. And when I landed in Sydney, Australia, I looked around and I said, you know what? I feel like I came home. I actually believed I was an Australian. I did. <laughs> really? Yeah, I really did. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Um, okay, and so before we go to the floor, I think we should touch a, a bit more on Sire Records, um, okay. if that's okay with you. Uh, an iconic label, some amazing acts associated with it. You did move on uh, at a certain point, but perhaps you could tell us about the acts you work with and how you found them and in what way you work with them when you founded Sire. Right. At the beginning, Sire, as I told you, took um, albums from, um, from uh, Europe and established itself because we were able to take advantage of the shift in the industry um, by having albums. Uh, we grew, uh, on, we grew, we grew uh, pretty big. We had a, 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 an instrumental record called Hocus Pocus, Again, these are very old records that, um, that, that sold millions around the world, and we got that by licensing it the same way. But then we saw the change in the industry coming, and this new, this new place, uh, the Lower East Side of Manhattan, CBGB's. CBGB's was, I don't know what would be the, the worst possible dirtiest, um, cheapest bar in Bogota, okay? What could it possibly be? You know, you, there couldn't be any place worse than this. That's where the bands played. That's where the punk bands played. Now, is there a place in Bogota like that? Yeah? You tell us, you tell us. Where would I go to find absolutely the worst place where I wouldn't want to be at night, but where the music was great? Yeah? What was that? I think there aren't, there aren't any bad places in Bogota. I think oh, they're all us. beautiful. Okay, okay. So, so anyway, we would go down to CBGB's, and that's where we found the Ramones. Um, and from the Ramones, uh, I was about to leave Sire at the time, but I found Blondie, uh, Richard Hale and the Voidoids, Seymour signed Talking Heads, and then because of all that, you found that artists from other parts of the world wanted to be on Sire because they loved the Talking Heads, they loved the Ramones. Um, uh, so that's how Depeche Mode came to Sire. Uh, Chrissy Hind, uh, the Pretenders came to Sire that way. And there's, a, there's an interesting story Seymour tells. He's not here. My, my partner at Siam, when he signed Madonna. And um, he heard Madonna in a, um, uh, a disc jockey, a DJ, brought a, um, um, a tape of Madonna singing one of her songs. I think it was one of the very early, the first songs she did. And uh, he liked it, and, and he was going to have a meeting with her, but he got sick. He had something with his heart, and he was put in the hospital. And, and this is another lesson of how you succeed. Um, she wouldn't let that stop her. She came to the hospital 
and talked to him and sang while he was in the hospital bed. So Madonna sang and talked to him there, and when he got out of the hospital, he went back and he signed, uh, he signed Madonna. And um, again, the lesson is you, you have to be persistent. She was persistent. The first record she did was pretty successful. The next one, a little more. And then came uh, Material Girl, you know. Um, and Material Girl broke everything wide open. And she became uh, um, the, the biggest star in the world. And it all started in a hospital bed. This is amazing. We're hearing, we're hearing music business history. Um, so listen, we, we can uh, see if any of you would like to ask a question now. Would, would anyone in the audience like to ask Richard a question? Anything you like? Don't be shy. Please don't be shy. Okay, we've got, we've got one over there, that gentleman over there. Oh, we've got a few now. So let's take a microphone over there and uh, we'll pass it around a bit. Do we have a microphone to pass around? <laughs> Okay, it might take a sec. might take a sec. I tell you what, if you walk up here, I'll, I'll give you this one. Oh, okay, we've got someone coming to you, I think. I think someone's coming. Preguntas? Hey, Richard. Hola. Okay, so you were saying that the future of music business for both artists and, you know, people that are in the business, it's related to songwriting and publishing, right? And this, you know, bearing in mind that you were saying that everything is going to be streaming, how do you think that the collection of rights and performance rights in general are going to be affected? once everything is streaming, because you know, if we don't have downloads and we're not buying music online, then everything's gonna be streamed. So I guess this guy, there has to be a system in which artists get paid for the royalties, well, and they get paid for each time it's streamed. And right now I know that it's very, it's very tricky to learn how to, you know, how to price and how to measure how many times it's streamed, how, how much it can pay, how, how, you know, and with the licenses, licenses and everything, it's gonna be, it's going to be difficult. So I just want to know what, what your perspective is with the orchard and what do you think your competitors are going to do in terms of collecting rights and with streaming services? Well, streaming services pay. Um, don't get it wrong. It, it, what they, it, streaming services do pay. You just have to get played a lot over and over and over again. Um, but just as radio, you only get a little, but you get a lot when it adds up. The truth is that when I say eventually you're not going to buy CDs or vinyl, you will. You buy them of your favorite artists. You buy, buy them of people you want to support. But the economies of the world are changing in general. So if we talk about streaming services, well, we better be prepared for the day when we don't have money. I mean, that's not that far off. Don't, don't believe for a minute that, I mean, coming down here, I mean, what, a dollar to 10,000 pesos? I mean, you walk around with, you think you're a millionaire walking around with Colombian money, but you're really not. So think about the day that money goes away and, and you're just using stip cards. So how you perceive or what you buy and sell, there'll be an entirely different consciousness of it. So I don't know that I could answer other than to say, if you continue in this day and age to make good music and it gets played through streaming services, you have an obligation as an artist to drive your fans, to inform them, to, um, to get them to engage. And with that, you'll continue to, to make a degree of revenue, whether it's more or less than what you would make from selling. Um, I don't know. I would think in the meantime, it's probably less, but it's the way. 
It's, it's not going to change. And you have to remember, I think it was brought up today uh, by Matthew, that um, um, when the discussion came up in the question of Deza, that so many people were taking things for nothing on the, um, on the Internet and just downloading things and not paying for them. But when you subscribe to a subscription service, to a service, a streaming service, there is a monetary value to it, and it changes the, con the concept that you can just take something for nothing. So I don't, I don't know. It's a long answer that, uh, that it's not... It's, th there's no easy answer to it, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard, and thanks for the question. So we've got a mic in the audience now. Have we got a question over there? Great, let's go to you. Hi, Richard. It's See. a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Um, Richard, let's say there's an artist and he's just to, to take a, sing, a new single out to the market, right? He has got his, his own marketing staff ready to go, and radio is ready, um, concerts are ready, but the digital part of his business is not ready. Like, he doesn't know what to do in that aspect. What's the step or the steps he has to make in the digital aspect? In the digital aspect. Yeah. It's, you know, I mean, I, I think the artist should go through an organization like The Orchard that can help make available all over his di digital music. Um, but also, um, to, you, you need to deal with, I think, you need to deal with some, someone like this. There are a number of places one could go other than The Orchard. I just know it's the best, but um, I think dealing with YouTube is very important, but I have a feeling they would prefer to deal with a larger organization than an individual artist. Uh, the same thing would be true of iTunes. Um, so I, I think someone coming to the orchard with um, a finished piece of music and um, getting it into the system so at least it's available everywhere for something to happen is the, um, is the thing to do. It's very hard today to be out there on your own as an individual uh, artist because there are so many. And uh, people have so many choices and so little time, you know, when they're dealing with all the other digital um, uh, information that's coming at them constantly. So for a musical artist, I would say finding, finding someone like The Orchard to work with would be the right thing to do. Great. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for the question as well. So who have we got next? Okay, over to you, sir. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Mi pregunta es la siguiente. Conozco una excelente guitarrista colombiana que se llama Catalina González. I, I, I do apologize. I apologize, but we don't have a translation. Well, you said here, so something about having an, can, an excellent artist like Catarina Gonzalez. Can someone Gonzalez? translate I'll for trans us? I'll, I'll translate for him. Thank you very much. He says he's, he knows a very well uh, good, a very well known, no, not a very well known. He knows a very good guitarist named Catalina. ¿Cómo hace Orchard? ¿O qué debemos hacer para que sea más conocida y que se pueda uh, beneficiar de los servicios que ustedes están ofreciendo. How does, a how, how does a company like Orchard help someone like that? And, uh, or how, what are the steps to follow to basically get someone like that to just uh, be able to be on a more, uh, like a major stage? Um, again, it's an, if it's an individual artist, um, in order for an individual artist to succeed at any, any serious level, there has to be more to it. There has to be a following for the artist. Uh, the artist has to develop some sort of fan base. What the orchard can do is make the music available. Once it's available, you can then start to get something to happen for the artist. And once that begins and you begin to build a fan base, there are things and tools 
within the orchard that you can use to reach a wider fan base. There are applications, there are um, different means we have of doing self-promotion, of uh, dealing with analytics if you're playing in a certain um, city or environment, knowing uh, what's selling and how it's doing. But with the individual artist, it, becomes, uh, it still becomes difficult. You know, I mean, I would think if it's an unknown individual artist, there are companies, um, other than the orchard, that are smaller that might be able to help you um, better. However, that said, how great is the guitar player? How, how great? Very great? Katarina, see. But ask him, how, how great is she? How, um, so do we know how many YouTube hits that they have or, you know, how... He said it's very good. Yeah. Just it's good. very good guitarist. Okay. What? Here comes the microphone. He says that she's got a pretty good following on, on, uh, on YouTube, about 15,000 subscribers, what he says. That's fantastic. Well, there you go. So, yes, the orchard would be interested, but you know, I would personally be interested. So, when we get done, if you can give me the name, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to follow up and check it out. So, come talk to us afterwards, and thank you for All the right? question. So, who has the next question? Where's the mic going? To this gentleman standing up, I think, or? We've got time for a couple more, so. ¿Qué piensas de GrowthShark, que es un servicio de streaming gratuito? He's saying, what do you think about GrowthShark? If you know, uh, it's a, stream, a free streaming service in Colombia. GrowthShark, what do you think about it? I don't understand it. What do you? Uh, do, do you know a service called Boom, know, Boom Chart? Groove Chart. Oh, Groove Chart. So it's a Colombian uh, oh, platform. Oh, Groove Shark. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, Groove Shark. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, difficult I, I, question. All I know is they were putting um, music up that they didn't have any rights to, and then they would try to get the rights later. Um, I don't think it. I, I, it doesn't interest me. Okay. Next question. Uh, me. Um, my question is, um, what do you think about Latin American uh, rock music? Because the mainstream here is more like uh, folklore or tropical music. Does Latin American rock ha uh, have an option to be world, uh, worldwide recognized? I don't know. Um. Yeah, I mean, um, again, it's got to be unique and really, um, really special. Um, I would love to find some um, Colombian rock or punk or metal musicians, you know, and be able to help spread that through the rest of the world. Um, traditional Colombian music, um, it, it's easy because uh, you find, you know, you find people that that like uh, the beats um, everywhere in the world. You know, uh, I know, I know probably, I was speaking to somebody who did an interview with me and I mentioned the name Shakira, and he said, well, she's not Colombian anymore, you know, but, uh, but she is, and just because she succeeded, that's one thing, but that's not a rock musician. I would love to find a rock band from Colombia or Argentina or, or Chile, you know, um, that would be great. And that's one of the things I would hope people would tell me about while I'm down here, you know, that, that there's this great rock band. You, you have to see it, you know, and that's, that's really what I would love to find. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Now we have time for one last question. Is there anyone who has a question? This has to be the last one, I'm afraid. Um, okay, so yes. thank you. Um, my question is, um, what, you, what do you think about uh, how how the masters, the master track 
uh, of a song must be uh, to uh, to be in iTunes, to be in Spotify, or or in the Orchard. Uh, how my master should be, because uh, when we go to a label, we do the best for to uh, to bring a great track, and they say it's a good demo, but it's not the it's not the master. What do you think uh, with our with the networks? What is the standard? I, I don't think. Um Necessarily, iTunes has any uh, cr critical standard as long as it's up to professional standards that it that it sounds good, and there's particular ways. Then, when you master it, the equalization has to be done a certain way. But but I don't think that most uh, any of these services, most of the services, necessarily make a critical judgment on whether it's good or bad. It just has to adhere to copyright laws um, and be proper. If you go to a label and they don't think it's good enough, then they don't have to take it. But you could put that up on YouTube yourself, and you, you might find people like it. You know, um, there's different levels of quality. Some it's the highest quality, but sometimes the lowest quality is great also because it has... Um, It has soul. It has a spirit. You know, so if, if you go to a label and they don't like it, they don't like it. But that doesn't, that shouldn't stop you if you think it's, um, it's something special and you believe in it. Okay, thank you, Richard. Well, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we have to call it to a close there. Richard, you've been fantastic. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us today. Richard Gotra. Actually, I... I, I ask you to forgive me because I should have been standing up all the time. It's a lot better to look at people than to sit back and have lights in your eyes. And also, I promise everyone in the room that, that if I'm invited next year to this really great conference, I will speak to everyone in Spanish. I am not going to speak in English anymore. <laughs> Fuck the English! We're going to speak Spanish! Oh, wait! We, we have an English person here, so I, I retract that statement. I retract it. But I will speak in Spanish, I promise. I'll learn it too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.